Welcome everybody this morning. Welcome those of you who are here. Um, we just want to praise God for you and thank God for you. We welcome each one of you out there. Thank God for each one of you. We pray that God's blessing will be upon every one of you. I'm going to tell you up front today that I may say some things that might irritate some of you out there. I don't think that it's going to irritate people here, but maybe someone out there may be. And I, so I just want you to be aware of that up front. We're going to start by looking at Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, verse 1. Many of you are familiar with this particular passage of Scripture, but we're going to begin here. Hebrews 11, 1. It says, Faith assures us of things we expect and convinces us of the existence of things we cannot see. God accepted our ancestors because of their faith. And faith convinces us that God created the whole world by His Word. This means what can be seen was made by something that could not be seen. We go down to verse, verse 6. And no one can please God without faith. And whoever comes to God must believe that God exists and that He, is, that he rewards those who seek Him. As you may have, may have gathered, we're going to start talking about faith. I believe that we need to get back to some of the basics of our Christian walk. As I was studying... I started looking at some of the beliefs of the church. And these are some statistics. Uh, it may sound tedious to you, but I think there are things that we need to understand. There were some questions asked by some pollsters. Uh, in, case you, in case you are interested in any of these, there's an organization out there called BARNAS, B-A-R-N-A-S, Cultural Research Center, which which uh, shows how professing Christians are developing. And on one, of the, on one of the latest polls, they were asked these questions. Having faith, does having faith matter more than which faith you have? Now, I, I want to clarify something here. Faith is not what you believe. Faith is what you do about what you believe. So the question here is, is having faith, doing something about what you believe, more important than what, what your faith is based on? And ba broken down by types of Christian organizations, it says all, all of the uh, adults who were asked this, 63% said that having faith matters more than having faith in something particular. 56% of evangelical churches, people asked in evangelical churches, 56% said that they believe that having a faith is more important than what, you, what your faith is. The Pentecostal church, which is based upon faith, 62% said that having faith is more important than what you have faith about. Than your faith that you have. And I could go on with all of these. Surprising, well, 77% of Catholics said that having faith is more important than what you have faith in. Broken down politically, conservatives, 59% said that Having faith is more important than what you have faith in, and 69% of the liberals said so. The next question was, you can con conscientiously and consistently, or you conscientiously and consistently try to avoid sinning because you know your sins break God's heart? There's a question. You know, I don't know how you, how you feel. Do you avoid sinning because you know that sins... Father God. Think about it. 85% of the evangelicals said they believe that. That's good. 82% of the Pentecostals said they believe that. 
58% of mainline Protestant churches. 58%. So they believe that, that they don't sin because they don't want to go against God. The next question says, you have a personal responsibility in appropriate situations to share your religious beliefs with people who believe differently than you do. Now, we are called by God to do what? Remember, we have two commands. Love God, love our neighbor. And one commission, the job that God has given to us, go forth into all the world and preach the gospel. So this is... You, this question was, do you have a personal relation, responsibility to, under, per, under appropriate situations, to share your religious belief? Out of all the Christians, all the people I asked, these are Christians, well, Christians and non-Christians, only 49% said they do. Of the evangelicals, as you would expect, 74% said, yes, we believe that it's our job to go out and share our faith. 74% of the Pentecostals will also believe that. But when you go to the mainline Protestant churches, which includes the Baptists, the Lutherans, Reformed, the Presbyterians, and so forth, only 48, less than half, of those believe that it's important to share their faith. The Catholics outnumber them by 54%. They, they're 54% in that. The next question was, a person who is generally good or does enough good things for others will earn a place in heaven. Now, I don't know how you feel about that. But of all the people asked, 48%, about half of them, said that they believe that that's true. In the evangelical church, believing that the good things that we do outbalance out the bad things that we do, 41% said that they believed that. And in the Pentecostal church, it was 46%. Within the Catholic church, it's 70%. Who believe that your works are more important towards your place in heaven, towards your salvation, than the blood of Christ. The last question was, do you consider yourself to be a Christian... And when you die, will you go to heaven? Only because, here's the, here's the clarification, only because you have confessed your sins and have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Overall, only 33% of the adults asked believed or said, yes, we agree with the fact that we are going to go to heaven because we believe in Jesus and have confessed our sins. Of the evangelical churches... 72% said, yes, that's what we believe. We believe that. But at the same time, 41% said, well, we believe that our works, doing more good works than bad works, is going to get us a place in heaven. The shocking part here is only 55% of the Pentecostals said that we're going to go to heaven because we put our faith in Jesus Christ alone. There was an area in there called the Born Again Christians of the born-again Christians. These are people who have recognized that we are saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest any man can boast, so, so that no one can boast. A hundred percent of them said, yes, we are saved by the blood of Jesus only. But the amazing thing here are those numbers of the evangelicals, the Pentecostals, the main mainline Protestant churches that fall into these lower numbers of things that, that are part of our basic faith as Christians. Out of these eight categories, I'm gonna, it says, the only one showing a majority of pastors holding to the biblical worldview was the purpose of life and calling was 57%. Only one showing a majority of pastors. And that was that the biblical view is important 57% of the pastors said so. In the remaining categories, a minority of pastors were found to hold the biblical worldview. 40%, 47% of the pastors, these are pastors, 47% of the pastors hold that 
uh, hold on family and the value of life. Only 44% of the pastors stand on God and creation and the history as it is in the Bible. Only 43% of pastors stand on living your faith. And only 43% of the pastors agree that we should not sin and that salvation and God and our relationship to Him comes through a, a walk with Christ and, and living according to the Word. 40% are believe that human character matter. And only 40% on lifestyle. That means our behavior, our relationships, and so forth. And only 39% of pastors believe that the Bible is true and gives us a standard for living. Similar research conducted earlier this year, reported on CBN News, by the way, found that although 67% of parents with preteen children identified as Christian, only 2% of those felt that it was necessary to go to church with their children so that they can learn about the Bible. 67% said we're Christians, but only 2% said it's important for us to get our children in church, into a Sunday school, into, into a Bible study, someplace where they can learn about the Bible. Among the senior pastors, Four out of ten, 41%, have a biblical worldview. In other words, 59% over half of the pastors do not have a biblical worldview. What's a biblical worldview mean? That we believe that God is in charge of all things, that the word that the word of God should be the standard for us to live, that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior, that Sexual purity is important. That honesty in government is important. That it's more important to serve the Lord than it is to make a lot of money. Those are the things we're talking about. Only 41% have a biblical worldview. That was 41% of senior pastors. 28% of associate pastors, which is less than half as many, Pastors who do teaching, in other words, they conduct Bible studies and believe that the Bible should be the standard for the way that we live, only 13%. And the ones who are now involved in youth ministry, children's pastors, youth ministry, only 12% of them believe that the Bible should be the standard to the way that we live. Why the Bible speaks about false teachers... And it does. And we talk about false teachers who come up and make you know, cults and, and give us all kinds of false doctrines. The Bible talks about false teachers. We cannot think this is just an ancient problem. Half of the pastors surveyed denied one or more of the following tenets of the biblical worldview. First one, the Bible is accurate in its teaching. This Denial that Jesus was sinless. That's a big thing lately. One of the things that's going around is the fact is, is the teaching that Jesus lived, didn't live a sinless life, that you know he and Mary Magdalene had an affair and, and so forth. That Satan exists and is a real being. That God is omnipotent and omniscient. That He is all-powerful and all-knowing. That salvation is by grace alone. And that we are given the responsibility to share the gospel. Half of the pastors asked, disagreed with one or more of those basics of our Christian faith. It says here, remember, this is not the general public, but those who stand behind pulpits, and preach to you every Sunday. This group is either leading or misleading the doctrinal instruction of millions. We wonder why the church has gotten weak. 
We wonder why the church is... I mean, this, this is enough to make you, make you weep. When you think about the people who are preaching the gospel in churches, on TV, on, on the, the internet, the people who are preaching are disagreeing with biblical truths. Half of them. Hypocrisy. A new study research from the Cultural Research Center in, at Arizona Christian University has found that 37% of Christian pastors in the United States have a biblical word, have a biblical worldview, demonstrating that spiritual awakening is needed. Only 37% have a biblical worldview. Such things as a virgin birth. When asked, the American Lutherans, 19% believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Of the Baptists, only 34. Of the Episcopalians, 44%. Of the Methodists, 60%. And amazingly, I say amazingly because how the Catholics hold up Mary only 25% believe that there was actually a virgin birth. So what do, we, what do we find from all of this? We find that there is a need in the church for renovation, spiritual renovation. There is a need in the church for a spiritual renovation. Because every church organization out there mentioned has a great number of people who do not adhere to the Word of God. How are we supposed to see a world get better if we don't have the standard of the Bible to walk by? We've moved God out of our schools. We've moved Him out of our politics. We've moved God you know, out of the courts. We've, we've taken Him out of everything, including, in some cases, the church. Ministers who stand in the pulpit and want to compromise on the Word of God are actually giving in to Satan and teaching the things of Satan to the congregations. And because the person standing in the pulpit is in a position of authority, the people receive it without question. And so we see many, almost, almost all of our churches who have done away with their evening Bible studies and prayer and praise services, who have done away with Sunday school for the children, Because we're not living by the standard that God has set for us. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 says, Stop forming inappropriate relationships with unbelievers. Can the right and wrong be partners? Can light have anything in common with darkness? Can Christ agree with the devil? Can a believer share life with an unbeliever? Can God's temple contain false gods? I, you know, I'm going to stop there for a second. We'll pick up that. Have you noticed those bumper stickers that say coexist and it has all the symbols of the different religions on it? And talking about, oh, we just have to live together. We have to be tolerant of everybody else's viewpoint. Do you know what? The word tolerance is not found in the Bible anywhere. The word tolerance is not in the Bible. We are not told that we should tolerate anything other than the Word of God. There is no other way through, except through Jesus Christ to get to the Father who is the King of Heaven. And yet... Our Christian churches here in the United States have started pushing aside every truth right down to the very basics. Is there a heaven and a hell? Many of them go, well, 
I, I believe in heaven and I expect to go there someday. I'm not sure about hell. Some of them said, I, well, I don't know that I believe in the devil. I think, that, I, I think Satan is just a, a term that is used just for bad people, bad things. Asked, when they asked, how many of you believe in the Trinity? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Most of them said they believe in the Trinity. But they weren't sure about that Holy Spirit thing. And they weren't sure that, that the three were one. We already talked about the virgin birth. There are some out there that say Jesus didn't literally die on the cross and that if He didn't literally die on the cross, then He didn't rise from the dead. And if He didn't rise from the dead, Paul says, then what are we doing? We have nothing to offer if we don't have the resurrection to offer. And so... Worldliness and the world vision of uh, the worldly vision of, of society starts to grow within the body of Christ to the point where we no longer call sin sin and we no longer call righteousness righteousness and people think that they can be righteous simply because they come and sit in a pew in a church rather than because they committed their lives to Jesus Christ for as Lord and Savior of their lives. Can God's temple contain false gods? Clearly, we are the temple of the living God. Back in 2 Corinthians 6. As God said, I will live and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. The Lord says, get away from unbelievers. Separate yourself from them. Have nothing to do with anything unclean. Then I will welcome you. The Lord Almighty says, I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters if you do these things. In Ephesians 5, we're told that we should imitate God since we're His children. Live in His love. Don't let sexual sins and perversions of any kind or greed be mentioned among you. This is not appropriate believer for God's holy people. Since wh why are we even debating in our churches? Why, why would it even come up in our churches to, to question whether or not homosexuality is good or whether it's a sin? Listen, folks. I don't care what you believe. God does not change His mind about what is sin and what is holiness because of what you think. What He says is sin is sin. It doesn't make any difference. If everybody in this whole world chooses to think that it is not sin, God says it is sin. And that same thing with adulteries, with all kinds of perversions, with lying and cheating and cowardice and murders and thefts, all of these things. God says they're sins. He's not going to change His viewpoint because you don't like it. God is God. And when we stand in judgment, we're not going to stand before the Pope. We're not going to stand before some, some minister who's the head of some organization. He's not going to ask us whether we're Baptist or Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Catholic, whatever. He's going to, all we're going to do is stand there in judgment based upon what Jesus has done for us and how we've accepted that. So as we read in Hebrews 11, nobody can please God without faith. And faith is, and sometimes this is kind of confusing to people because in the King James it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. What does that mean? The substance of things hoped for. The safe faith is not the product of reasoning. You know, I can't reason out faith. Uh, reason is based upon the Word of God. Faith comes from the Holy Spirit planting the Word of God in us. Isaiah 
Chapter 1 and verse 18 says, Come and let's reason together, says the Lord. Even though your sin be as scarlet, I can, it can be white as snow. You know, we, we, the only one we can reason with is God according to His Word. I can't reason within myself, is this good or is this bad? If I don't know that it's a good thing to do, it becomes a sin for me. That which is done without, that is, that is without faith becomes sin. It's impossible for us to please God without faith. Trust in the Lord, Proverbs says, with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. You can't figure it out yourself. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Now, that means recognize that God is in control and that His Word is the pattern by which, the law by which we're going to live. Acknowledge Him and then He'll direct your path. And don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. See, too many people think that they're smarter than God. Too many people think that, well, you know, what God said was for back then, but this is a new society, a new, a new group of people. Let me tell you something. God did not change His views. What was good for people 4,000 years ago is still good for people today. And, and though we think that we have gotten smarter, we have only proven that we have gotten dumber. Because everything that man tries to do on their own to remedy the problems of life becomes a new problem. And now we have two. And then four. And then so many problems we don't know what to deal with. And then we throw our hands up in the air and say, what's the use? No sense in trying anymore. We can't fix this problem. And we're absolutely right. We can't fix this problem. We need to go back to the very beginning and we need to look at Jesus Christ and we need to see that He is the way, the truth, and the life. That God's law, God's word, is the way that He causes us to live or wants us to live. Faith is, is not a product of reason. Faith is based upon the Word of God and how the Holy Spirit puts that in our hearts. Faith does not, I want to say this again, faith does not move God. I say it again because there are people out there who will tell you the opposite. Faith does not move God. It, faith acts upon the movements of God. We are not going to change God and His ways or His motives or His plans because we say we have faith in something. Our faith is taking and changing us, changing away the way that we think, changing the way that we act based upon what God is doing. We need to get past all of this because some of these teachings, which we call great faith teachings, are simply lies. Faith does not move God. God moves and that's what we have faith in. We said earlier, the way people are asked, does it matter if you have faith more so than mattering on what you have faith in? No. Or yes, it does. It, or no, it matters that more than what we have faith in than the fact that we have faith. I can have faith that I can fly. And I can jump, go up here on the roof and I can dive off. See, remember, faith is what we do about what we believe. It's not going to change anything. When I hit the ground, I'm going to recognize that my faith was false. But if I have faith in what God's Word says, it's going to be right. See, believing something is saying, I believe that I can swim five miles into the ocean. Faith says, I'm in the ocean and I'm swimming. And I'm believing that I'm going to make it five miles. Now, if I'm doing that because God has directed me to do so, I'm going to make it. If I'm doing it because I just wanted to see whether I can make it five miles, they're going to come out with a rescue boat and either rescue me or look for my body. Faith is what I'm doing about what I believe. Faith does not move God. It acts upon the movements of God. When God says, and I stand on what God has said, 
then that's faith. So when we say faith is the substance of things hoped for, that word substance kind of throws us because we think of substance as something solid. This has substance. See, that's what we talk about. But that's not what the word substance means. Substance is a quality of becoming important or valid that were significant. You can look it up. See, it can mean substance, something solid, but it also, when it comes to ideas and, and ideals and, and, and understandings, faith is what gives something significance in our life, or you know, substance is what gives something significance. So faith is the significance of the things that we hope for. It is, I, I hope for this, and, I, I, and the word hoped, you know, Paul says, hope is something that you see far off and you, don't, haven't, yet, you haven't yet gotten it. Faith is what I find is, as important or valid or significant in what I've hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. Evidence is that which tends to prove or disprove something. Something that makes plain or clearer an indication or a sign of something. So what faith is, is this thing that gives, gives what I believe in uh, uh, a, a importance and a validity and a significance in my life. And it is, it is what makes my beliefs plain. It makes it plain because I'm doing something with it. What I've, things that I, I can't see, I'm doing something about it. That's why James could say, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, you can say you believe something all you want, but until you stand on that and you, and you live that out, you do not have faith. You just have a theory. You have an idea. You have maybe a belief. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. His blood shed for me. It cleanses me from all sin. And that He is the Lord of my life. What does that mean? Faith says then that I am going to commit myself to Him. That I'm going to believe that I'm going to go to heaven because of His shed blood. Not based upon my good deeds. It's not because I did more good than I did wicked. That my, my faith says I'm trusting in Jesus Christ and Christ alone for my salvation. And the fact that He is the Lord of my life says I am going to do what He said whether or not it's convenient. Because He said it. He is Lord and He has done dominion in my life and he has the authority to direct my walk see what we have in the church in the United States the church in America today is a bunch of wishy-washy panty waist people who are afraid to stand on the truth and they want to let the world come in and teach, tell them, well, what you stand on isn't true. See, everybody else over here believes this. You can't keep on standing on the Bible because there's too many people out there who don't believe the Bible anymore. So what? Jesus already told us that the majority of people are going to walk that, that wide path that leads to death and destruction. But there are a few who walk on the narrow path that leads into the gate of, of heaven. So why should I yield to those on that wide path when Jesus has already warned me about it? If 99 and 99 one hundredth percent of the population of this world decides that the Bible is untrue, it does not change one truth in the Bible. We live our lives for Christ. And if we say that we're going to walk by faith, then we need to walk by faith. We can't walk half-heartedly. When I start to compromise my faith, what I've started to do is to agree with the devil. When I start to say, well, I know what the Bible says, but you know, automatically, I am now walking with the devil. What happened in the Garden of Eden? Satan came in the form of the serpent to, to Eve. He says, you can eat of everything. And Eve goes, well, we can eat of everything except that one tree. We're told not to eat that or, not, or touch it. You know, I'm not going to argue that point. You know, you know, maybe God said not to touch it. It just wasn't recorded. But anyhow, the, the fact of the matter is, Satan says, oh, well, you know, God, God, you, you won't die. Go ahead. See, 
Now, Eve at that point could have said, Satan, get out of here. But she started compromising and listening to what he had to say and looking at the fruit of the tree and saw that it was good looking and it looked like it was going to taste good. And so she started siding with the devil. Oh, the devil says I wasn't going to die when I eat of it. I guess, you know, maybe, maybe he's right. Maybe I should go ahead and try it. I mean, after all, one little bite isn't going to hurt anything, is it? And then so she gave in to that. And she took her bite. And she didn't drop dead. And so she went to Adam and said, Adam, look, I take a bite of this fruit from that tree that God said I should, we shouldn't eat from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And look, I'm not dead. See, the devil, the, the serpent said that I wasn't going to die. He was, I didn't die. Look, God must have been telling us a story. Maybe, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we heard it wrong. Maybe it's, maybe it's not true. And so Adam gave in to the fact that his wife had already tried it. How many times do we give in to something because our neighbors, our, our husbands, our wives, our, our parents, our children, or our friends have tried something and, you know, it did not turn out negatively for them immediately. And so we go, oh, well, it must be okay because they did it and nothing bad happened. You know, maybe some of the thinking that they had, oh, well, there's... You know, people ask me, do you think that God put people on other planets? My answer to them is this. I don't know and I don't care. we got enough problems right here on our own planet to keep us, happy, or keep us going for, for the rest of our lives. Why do I want to worry about that? If God did and He didn't tell us about it, obviously it's because He didn't want us to know. So, hey, I'm not going to say anything about that. I don't know. It's, it's not wrong to say you don't know. See, the thing is this. Do we believe what God has said? Do we spend all of our time looking at things which God has not said and trying to develop a doctrine for life based upon things that were not told to us by the Lord, that are not directed by the Holy Spirit, and at the same time taking what God did say and trying to change it to match the ideas of mankind who are coming up with crazy hypotheses and theories based upon things that God did not say? None of these things make sense. But when we read the statistics about what's going on in the church today, we find that there is a validity to God's Word, and we are told to bring every thought under subjection to Christ, that there is a reason for that. So Jesus, in speaking to His disciples, he had gone from Jerusalem into Bethany, and on the way he passes a fig tree which is not bearing any fruit. And he cursed the fig tree, and they went on their way. He says, from now on, you're not going to bear any fruit. You're not worth anything. Goes on their way and comes back the next day, and the, fruit, and the tree is dead. And the, and the disciples get all excited about that. Now, in today's society, we would go, well, you know, there was probably something in the ground that killed the fig tree. That's probably why it wasn't producing fruit in the first place. You know, it really hasn't had a lot of rain lately. It was probably dying anyway. It just happened that maybe some, you know, a, a little meteorite flew from, fell from the sky and hit it last night. You know, we come up with some kind of crazy idea. But the disciples recognized that Jesus had spoken and it came to pass. And Jesus' response to that was, if you have faith, you can not only say to the fig tree, you know, die, get up, be unrooted, whatever. You can say to the mountain, be removed. If you have faith. And in a place, he, he says, you know, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say these things and you can expect them to be done. Now, you know, we in our, we in our silly, humanistic, minds, we get the idea that faith as in the physical size of a grain of mustard seed. And we go around like, well, how big is a grain of mustard seed? Who cares how big a grain of mustard seed is? That's not the, that's not the point. What, he's, what he was saying, mustard seed is like that small, it's that small seed that you place in the ground and it grows up into a big 
bush, a tree that the birds can nest in. That's the important thing. See, the seed, that tiny seed, grows into this great bush. We could have said, well, if you had, if you had faith like an acorn, which grows into a huge oak tree, or the seed of a pine, which grows into a huge, you know, pine tree. He could have said any of that. He, he happened to use mustard seed. And what he is saying to them is this. If you can just believe in the small things, those, that belief in small things is going to expose what God can do so that when bigger things come along, you will have no problem believing for those. But we want to analyze and make everything kind of natural. Then the natural thing for man to do, to think, is that we can handle it on our own. And all the while, we know in our hearts that we can't. If we look back over history, we find empire after empire, kingdom after kingdom, who thought that they could handle it on their own, and they no longer exist. What makes us think we're better? Because we have technology? We don't know what the people before the flood were like. Maybe they had technology too. I don't know. But they don't exist anymore. Why? Because they began to believe the things that the fallen angels and the demons were telling them and they turned away from God, and in that whole world full of people, and we don't know how many there were, there may have been billions of people there before the flood, we don't know, but in that whole world full of people, there was one man who stood firm on the Word of God, and when God says, Noah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to build this boat that's 450 feet long, and I want you to you make it in this particular way, and I'm going to bring in some some animals, and, and I'm going to just destroy this world, and I'm going to save you and your family and those animals if you just obey me. And Noah went out and he built the boat exactly the way God told him to do it. He did everything exactly the way God told him to do it. And when God destroyed the world, guess who was saved? The one who did what God told him to do exactly the way God told him to do it. The question is this. Are you going to do the things that God told you to do exactly the way God told you to do them? Or are you going to, you're going to bend corners and, and change change blueprints and do things the way you want them to do because they fit into your lifestyle and into the lifestyle of this world? Are you going to do what God told you to do or are you going to give in to the, com the, the compromising of the devil? Listen, folks. I am sick and tired of seeing the church get weaker and weaker, fewer and fewer people, and the ones that are growing are growing because people are being entertained and, and people are watching ministers who like to tell jokes and tell stories rather than preach the Word of God. And we don't go into a worship service with worship on our hearts. We go into a worship service to venerate, to, to, to exalt the band that's up front. We are more interested in buying their records than we are in getting on our knees and worshiping God. But when we're worshiping God, our thoughts need to be not on the band, not on the song leader. Our, worship needs, our thoughts need to be on Jesus Christ. And the words that we are saying or singing to Him, what is it that we are saying and singing to God? That's worship. If we accompany it with music, that's wonderful. Let us get back to where the church needs to be. We're going to continue on this study of faith, and then we're going to go into a study of the Holy Spirit and what it means to be filled with the Holy Ghost and walking in the power of the Spirit. Because the church needs to come back to the Lord. We need, we need a renovation in the church. I praise God for every one of you who is here today. I thank God you, you have ex exhibited the, the spirit of people who, who want to hear and want to learn and want to grow and want to exalt the Lord. Some of you out there, you would, you would if you could. Others of you have made an excuse not to be here doing those things. Not to be obeying the Word of God. 
You've made a reason to not obey the Word of God. You want to stay home and watch, watch ministries on TV. You want to watch them on YouTube. You want to watch them on the Internet, whatever. You have made it your purpose to disregard God's Word when He talks about what the church is all about. Coming together and, and, and edifying one another and strengthening one another and praying for one another and encouraging one another and listening, growing together in the Word of God. You've made it your decision to not do that. You are compromised with the devil. I'm sorry. That's what you've done. Now, some of you can't. I understand that. But others of you have made it that decision. And you are part of the negative numbers that we just read at the beginning of the service. You are part of the negative numbers. People go, well, why don't you have, why don't you have a Sunday school in your church? I will tell you why. Because when we had a Sunday school... Nobody showed up because nobody thought that it was important to get your children into Sunday school or for adults to sit in the Sunday school. You want to come? We'll have a Sunday school. How many of you don't go to Wednesday night services or Tuesday night services when your church is having evening services? Why? Because you have made a decision that it's not important. It is not important for you to be in the body of Christ and growing in the Word of God. You made that decision. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not, that's all I can say is you made the decision. I'm not keeping you at home. Nobody else is. The fact is the fact. Who are we? Are we born again, spirit-filled Christians who believe that the Word of God is true and every man is a liar? Or do we believe that the world is true and it's okay for us to compromise. Where are we? Where are you? Father, we thank you, God, for your, message, for your word. We thank you, God, that, that we can stand upon your word. We thank you, God, that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And we can, we can believe every word that you've given to us. That faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so, Lord, we just open our hearts to your word so that we can have the faith that we need to yes. walk the walk that you ask of us. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. If you today are not a born-again Christian, or if you have found through this morning's message that you are one of those who is a moderate, compromising Christian, and you want to get things straightened out with God, the, the, the only thing I can suggest to you is this, that you and God get together in your quiet place and you confess before Him your sins and ask Him to forgive you. And the Bible says that He will, he will not only forgive your sins, but He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness because that's the way our God is. But you got to mean it. you got to mean it. And now may the grace of God be with you. And may His love be poured into you. And may His Holy Spirit guide you. And when Jesus comes, may He find you actively worshiping Him. Amen. God bless each one of you.